Okay, this video is called High Fat Meal Effect on Blood and the Brain. The video started out as a book review of Multiple Sclerosis Diet by Roy Swank, MD. And his theory of multiple sclerosis causation was like a two-hit hypothesis. Number one, leaky gut, and second to that was increased blood-brain barrier permeability. And as I started reading about blood-brain barrier permeability, it's something that I've been interested in off and on for years. Um, I just kept coming across more interesting articles, and so that's how this all got put together. Uh, we'll start out talking about multiple sclerosis diet by Roy Swank, and we'll quickly get into the effect of high-fat meal on the blood-brain barrier and why it makes you stupid. Okay, so Roy Swank was a neurologist originally from Canada, then he went to Oregon in about 1954. He was a mentor to Dr. John McDougall. By the way, Dr. John McDougall has several videos of his conversations with Dr. Swank, and they're very good videos. If you're at all interested in MS, I really recommend you read this because this guy did a great thing with MS. Swank, he followed patients for 34 years, and if he had started treatment of the patients early, 95% still had intact ADLs, activities of daily living, at 34-year follow-up. That's amazing. You know, with conventional treatment for multiple sclerosis, the vast majority of those patients would be dead or severely disabled. You know, routinely at 10 years with conventional treatment, MS patients are 50% uh, wheelchair-bound or bed-bound or dead. Um, so... Conventional treatment with expensive medications does not work well, um, and it's very expensive, versus Swank's diet worked incredibly well. Now, Dr. Swank looked at the Norway data from the 1940s, and it was rather extraordinary. What he saw was during World War II, when people were rationed away from meat um, and sweets, they, had, uh, they were healthier. And the whole point was the diet was more important than psychological stress. Yeah, psychological stress is a big deal, but diet's even more important in terms of arterial health and autoimmune diseases. He then looked at more Norway data, and he found in the center of Norway where they had the dairy farms um, and the dairy in their diet, there was a lot of multiple sclerosis relatively severe. In the coast of Norway where they ate more plant foods and, and more fish instead of dairy, there was less MS and it was less severe. And that's an important point because... Usually when you hear people talking about the you know, global distribution of multiple sclerosis, they'll talk about in the north, people have more MS than around the equator, and is that because of sunshine and vitamin D? Um, and the point is, Norway, the difference between the latitude of the coast and the central areas is not that much. So it's not a question of latitude. This makes it easier to recognize, you know, it seems to be due just to primarily to the diet. Uh, the diet's more important than the amount of sunshine they get and the latitude. All right, the number one risk factor for multiple sclerosis is a high intake of dietary saturated fat, especially from dairy. And I'm going to explain in just a moment why I think dairy is the worst causative factor in multiple sclerosis. Um, Swank pointed out he had, you know, he even followed other patients up to 50 years. He said even really small amounts of saturated fat are associated with severely poor outcomes. These patients really cannot tolerate hardly any saturated fat. That's an important point. Okay, Dr. Swank allowed a little bit of dietary oils in small amounts and real small amounts of some animal foods, but I think that was a mistake. Dr. McDougall big time thinks that was a mistake. There's a lot of reasons why we think that's a mistake. Certainly, as far as MS is concerned, the saturated fats were worse. And I think what it might be about, here's my best guess, when you're eating meat, not only do you have all that saturated fat, but you also, well, when you're eating dairy, you got a lot of saturated fat, typically with whole milk, for example. Even 1% milk has a lot of sat fat. But then you also got the dairy proteins like the casein and the butyrophilin. And those seem to be, you know, highly related to the demyelination in MS patients. So the oil might cause leaky gut, but it doesn't come packaged with the dairy. So it doesn't cause as much problems. But oil is still bad. And one of the things I got out of looking at Swank's data, he still had patients who were having, you know, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarctions, and whatnot. And if you eat a sort of a McDougal, Assassin's, Rogers, Spartan vegan diet, whatever, you're very unlikely to get coronary artery disease. So that, that was a weakness of Swank. And I read Swank's book, and quite frankly, you know, the guy's a genius for figuring out how to, you know, cure these MS patients. But when it came to nutrition, he was a, kind of an ignoramus about a lot of things. He would, you know, 
he really doesn't know that much about nutrition in general. So it was very good for him to meet Dr. McDougal and learn more about it. By the way, him and McDougal did do a study, but I think they kind of got ripped off by the Oregon University. I saw how they set up the study, and it's as if they really didn't want it to be successful. And you can manipulate a research study and kind of distort the results. And that was my impression of what had happened. Because when they did a follow-up McDougal Swank combined study, the results were not as good as one would have expected. But I actually think the way they set up the study um, was deliberately done from what I can tell looking at it to, to make sure the diet didn't look that good. Um, okay, best theory for multiple sclerosis causation. I call it the Swank McDougal five-step hypothesis. First of all, something causes leaky gut. Now, just eating a, a high fat diet with especially a lot of saturated fat and dairy, what happens with a high fat diet is it's deficient in fiber. When a diet is deficient in fiber, there's basically two types of gut flora. Either you have a plant-based diet with a lot of fiber or you have a meat diet or a processed food diet, both of which are low in fiber. And so there's really only two major categories of gut microbiome. The one with meat and processed food or the one with plant foods and fiber. So the bad bacteria proliferate when there's no fiber. They erode the uh, gut lining called enterocytes because the gut's the enteric tract. And they erode through the mucus layer and they damage the enterocytes. And then you get a leaky gut whereby things can leak from the intestinal contents across the single cell layer of the gut lining and get into the submucosal space and cause immune reactions, get into the blood. Then what happens is the dairy proteins in particular will cause an immune response and antibodies will form to them. And then because their amino acid sequence is similar to that of the human body, both of us being mammals, the antibodies can cross-react with the own human body. Normally only a tripeptide or smaller can get across the gut lining. And that's too small to mount a big immune response. But when you've got these bigger chunks of protein that have gotten across the leaky gut, uh, damaged intestinal lining, now you can form antibodies to it. And they can cross-react. But the question would still be, how could those antibodies get into the brain? In order to get into the brain, you need a secondary problem. So that's why I call this a two-hit hypothesis. The first hit is leaky gut. The second hit is blood-brain barrier damage. And then the question is, well, why do you get blood-brain barrier damage? And it's thought due to hypoxia, lack of oxygen, um, and also potentially mechanical trauma to the capillaries from the blood sludge. So thickened blood, increased viscosity blood, has been referred to as blood sludge. The LDL cholesterol elevation in particular it causes what's called a rouleau formation. It overcomes the zeta potential. That's a negative charge on the outer surface of red blood cells due to their sialic acids. Um, and that's well known, by the way. No medical student or doctor has ever known that that I've talked to, but it's pretty obvious if you read about blood banking and stuff. And Dr. Sloop is the physician researcher in the medical community who sort of pioneered making that information available, Dr. Gregory Sloop. I made a previous video about him, probably the best research, atherosclerosis researcher in the world uh, alive today. Okay, excessive fat in the blood will deform the red blood cells into acanthocytes. Acantho means thorn. Um, and then A for asymmetric. So they're just to have spikes on one side of the red blood cell and echinocytes. Echino is like a hedgehog, kind of like a porcupine and E for equal spacing of the spines. Also, um, if there's increased stress, psychological stress or the equivalent sleep deprivation, caffeine, then you get all these prothrombotic uh, clotting factors, fibrinogen, Willenbrand factor, factor eight, antihemophilic factor, platelet activation. They'll make the blood more prothrombotic. It thickens the blood. Anything that thickens the blood causes hypertension and can also cause uh, decreased oxygen delivery in the capillaries, for example. Um, so that injury to the blood-brain barrier is then how those autoantibodies can get across and cause brain damage. Um, and in particular, they cause a type of brain damage called demyelination, meaning to remove the insulation cover around the neurons of myelin. Okay, just a couple other thoughts on multiple sclerosis before we get into the effect of a high-fat meal. Dr. Swank points out it's important to begin with the low-fat diet as soon as possible in the clinical course of these MS patients. You want to get it started before any major disability occurs because the major disability might not be reversible. If you start the low-saturated fat diet, you could usually prevent there from being any major disability. Dr. Swank reviewed the literature and says he doesn't find any definitive evidence of uh, multiple sclerosis being present in the ancient or medieval medical literature. 
Yeah, because people didn't eat that much fat in those days. Um, also, at around 1960 or so, he was in China, and he felt that they couldn't even find a single MS patient. They, they had some patients who they said maybe had MS, but he felt that wasn't convincing. And at that time, they were eating a rice-based diet with only an average of about 38 grams of fat per day. Um, that's very little. There's about 28 grams uh, in an ounce. So you can imagine that's less than two ounces of fat per day. Um, so Dr. Swank basically believes that before modern times, MS did not occur or was super, super rare. Um, if you look at identical twin studies, only about 20% of them both have MS, according to Dr. Swank. And Dr. Sari Stanchik had also observed some similar numbers in her uh, literature review of multiple sclerosis. Um, let's see, I, I talked about how the oils, you know, even though they cause leaky gut, they don't have the milk proteins, buterophilin or casein. Uh, Sari Stanchik wrote a good book called uh, What's Missing from Medicine. And I thought this was kind of funny. She started she's she had MS and she essentially cured herself of MS. She wrote that medical residency, you know, for doctors after they finish medical school, they do a residency. She wrote it teaches them bad health habits. She says they're sleep deprived, which is very stressful. They're stressed out, that's bad. They eat a really lousy diet typically, and they don't get much exercise. So that's funny because as you get more experience in medicine, one of the things you learn is that one of the best ways you learn how to help patients is by helping yourself. You want to help someone become skinny? Learn how to be skinny yourself. You want to help somebody learn how to be cognitively sharp and avoid brain fog? Learn how to do it for yourself. You want to figure out what's the best way to exercise? Learn how to do it for yourself. You want to figure out what's the best pre-workout meal? Experiment with it yourself. Um, so the point is, you know, physician heal thyself or only the wounded healer heals. All that uh, stuff like uh, Asclepius and whatnot. Anyways, um, so that was kind of funny. All right, miscellaneous things to know. You know, we talked about saturated fats and vegetable oils and all these other things, chlorinated water, antibiotics, uh, glyphosate, NSAIDs, aspirin, alcohol. They all cause leaky gut. There's a whole bunch of stuff that causes leaky gut. We're not going to get into that too much, but that's sort of step one for most, almost all autoimmune diseases. Okay, omega-6 fats cause problems because of lipid peroxidation. They'll damage the, the brain and the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. Dr. Tetsumori Yamashima has written several papers about this, and so he's a Japanese uh, neuroscientist. Omega-3 fats are associated with also lipid peroxidation, immune suppression, increased prostate cancer risk. Basically, you're not going to win with fat, you know. Uh, Pritikin was right, and McDougall, man, fat is bad, okay? It, it causes problems. I think the only good fat is just the tiny bit you get in normal whole plant foods. Um, All right, just a tiny bit more on dairy. The more milk people drink, the more MS the population will have. Here's a cross-reactivity between, um, it's called MOG, M-O-G, myelin, oligodendrocyte, glycoprotein, and buterophilin, uh, one of the proteins in milk. And then there's another paper. Cross-reactivity between casein, that's a major milk protein, with this myelin-associated glycoprotein causing central nervous system, brain, and spinal cord demyelination. So that's how MS is, uh, milk is so strongly associated with it because it's got not only a leaky gut cause, but it's got proteins that what it appears happening is the autoantibody that's formed to the foreign body milk getting into the, the mucosal space deep to the intestinal lining, those antibodies then cross-react with the brain tissue, the myelin, and cause demyelination. So once a neuron loses its insulation, it doesn't work so well. Okay, muscle sclerosis, fat oil relationship. Uh, he made the point that if you treat them early, here it was, 95% survived and remained physically active when they were treated early. The greatest benefit was to those who had minimal disability. So they would have some type of muscle sclerosis event and then quickly get treated. Those patients did fantastic. Um, here's a multiple sclerosis diet book by Swank. That's the one I just read and I was kind of talking to in the beginning of this talk here. Okay. Um, by the way, we're just about to get to the blood stuff and I think that's the most important, most interesting part of this talk because that affects everybody, not just MS patients. Okay. The more grams of milk consumed, the more MS. Uh, percentage of calories related to fat correlates with all these other diseases too. You're also getting heart disease and everything else. Um, 
intravascular aggregation and adhesiveness of the blood elements. So initially, the first thing coming up is all these chylomicrons. Right after you eat, they get dumped into the lymphatics. And so you have a pretty good bump up in chylomicrons by just three hours postprandial, even you know noticeable certainly at two hours. And the blood was becoming more adhesive, more sticky, more predisposed to clotting, where you see these little plus signs. And it was starting to reverse and improve. Uh, so basically, dietary fat makes the blood thick. Thick blood is bad because it doesn't deliver oxygen as well and it's more predisposed to clotting. If you give um, high fat meals to cardiac angina patients, that means uh, patients with a history of coronary artery atherosclerosis and narrowing whereby they get shortness of breath or chest pain on exertion, you feed them a high fat meal, they'll get it um, much more likely after they've had a high fat meal because the blood is thick and they're not oxygenating their tissues well. Okay, here's an example just of rouleau formation right here. I'll show you how this works. Red blood cell typically has about seven microns. Red blood cell shape, it's a biconcave disc, meaning it's concave on top and on bottom. Um, then typically the RBC about seven microns in diameter, capillary typically about five microns in diameter. So the RBC has to deform a little bit to pass through a capillary. When you have a bridging molecule due to, for example, LDL cholesterol or the acute phase reactant proteins from the liver like fibrinogen with being stressed, for example, um, those will stick the red blood cells together. Elevated uric acid can also do it. Um, fibrinogen, like I said, can do it. When the red blood cells are stuck together, it's harder for them to pass through the blood vessel and blood pressure will go up to sort of like push everything through the, the circuit. Um, here's just showing the higher the LDL cholesterol, the higher the blood viscosity. Um, the viscosity just means the thickness of the blood. Zeta potential is a negative charge. So there's a negative charge on the outer surface of a red blood cell. It's caused by something called the sialic acids, which is, just think of it as being like a glucose with a carboxylic acid added to it to make it have more of a negative charge. Okay, the bridging molecule is a molecule that can hold the RBCs together. We talked about IgM antibodies can do it. LDL cholesterol, fibrinogen, uric acid are examples of bridging molecules that can stick red blood cells together. Okay, so then what happened was Ansel Keys, let's say in the 1950s, you know, sort of figured out saturated fat predisposes people to myocardial infarction. But then after that, they start, and Peter Quo was a cardiologist in Pennsylvania who tested that and showed that when he fed sat fat, the black line here, you get peak lipemia. He checked the patient's blood lipids every 30 minutes, peak lipemia in about five hours. And after that, um, the patients would get chest pain. I mean, you could do this. You didn't have an intestinal review board back in those days. So he could do the, you know, can you imagine that's kind of crazy feeding these high fat meals to cardiac patients. Okay. And there was no coronary artery stenting back in those days in the 1950s. Uh, so he would induce chest pain in them. Okay. So then they say, well, what about unsaturated fat? Everybody thought unsaturated fats were going to be healthier. It turned out when they did unsaturated fats and they would start feeding these patients, let's say at nine o'clock in the morning, the sat fat at least would be worn off by, you know, nine hours at night. It's a long day for their workers. But when you fed them the unsaturated fat, like these oils, their blood would stay thick a prolonged amount of time. His workers were pissed off. They wanted to go home. So, and then the work was started by Peter Quo, the cardiologist from uh, uh, Pennsylvania. But later on, it was sort of taken up by Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman. They're both ophthalmologists. And they're the ones that put a microscope out where the eye and could view all this in real-time in humans. Um, here's some work of Dr. Swank. And Dr. McDougall has this video uh, on the internet. This is really worth watching. I 100% recommend you watch this. It's only about 50 seconds long, and it basically shows what happens to the red blood cells after a high-fat meal. So it's right here at Dr. McDougall Health and Medical Center, um, and the video is called Blood Sludge, Blood Flow Before and After Eating a Fatty Meal. So here's a picture from one of the research articles written by Dr. Swank about circulatory changes due to lipemia. And he's showing normal flow here. The red blood cells in the larger vessels are going so fast you can't even see them. And then when they pass through a capillary, they're passing individually. And they're, the key thing to look at them is they're relatively free and independent of each other. Now look what happens after these high-fat meals. They start all sticking together into a low formation like a stack of coins. They're clumping up. That's going to impair oxygen delivery. And here's more clumps of red blood cells, clumps of red blood cells. That's bad. As red blood cells clumping together is sort of an early step in the process of them forming a clot and potentially occluding the blood vessel and causing an infarction. So the terminology is with a lack of oxygen being delivered, that's ischemia. More severe, you'll, you'll call it hypoxia. And when you have a complete occlusion of an artery and then the ischemia to that causing damage to the tissue like dead tissue, that's called an infarct. So this is bad. 
the, the, the blood is clumping up and it's trending towards clotting, dropping its oxygen delivery. But that drop in oxygen delivery is going to be a big deal as we talk about more. Okay, so what does a high fat meal do? Why is it that people like myself who studied, you know, the effect of a high fat meal don't eat any animal products at all anymore? And I'm not a fan of high fat plant foods either. You get increased chylomicrons pretty quickly, especially after three to, you know, especially after three hours and up to about eight hours postprandial. And usually that's called blood sludge. The blood becomes stickier, um, more adhesive, more predisposed to thrombosis. LDL cholesterol with time will go up, especially people eating high fat meals all day, several times a day, what a typical American does. These things will all be happening at the same time concurrently. So LDL cholesterol is elevated in the blood. It's a bridging molecule, causes a low formation of the RBC, sticks them all together. After the high fat meal, the triglycerides become elevated and the free fatty acids in the blood. You get a drop in oxygen delivery. Typically, we think in humans of around 15 to 20%. But in hamster brains, for example, Roy Swank was able to measure things. He was getting up to like around 30% drop in oxygen delivery to the hamster brain tissue. That's really bad. And he felt that this chronic recurrent drop in oxygenation of the arterial lining called the endothelium was damaging the blood-brain barrier. Because the endothelial cells are the main component of the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier, BBB, is what separates the brain from the blood flow. And the neurons have to be isolated from blood flow because blood is highly variable. It changes a lot after you eat a meal. But a neuron needs a consistent surrounding environment, milieu, so that it can maintain all its ionic gradients for firing action potentials. Okay, what else happened? You get a change in shape of the red blood cells with saturated fat. You get ocanthocytes like thorn cells, asymmetric spurring, echinocytes, E for equal uh, spacing of the spurs. Um, you get decreased flow-mediated dilation, decreased ability to make nitric oxide and vasodilate. Okay, that's like the tourniquet test on the patient's arm. Um, you get, what about le causes leaky gut? Well, this, a lot of the foods that are going to cause in a high-fat meal, they're going to be associated with leaky gut. If you're eating meat in these oils, they cause leaky gut, okay? The problem, especially with the meat, is you can then get LPS, lipopolysaccharide, that's gram-negative endotoxin. You get more gram-negative bacteria, and the gram-negative bacteria make... Uh, lipopolysaccharide, LPS, the gram-negative endotoxin, and that will get into the blood. It'll activate something called toll-like receptor, and that's prothrombotic, so it's bad. That's, what's all, that's what they're talking about when they talk about postprandial means, prandial means eating. So postprandial, meat-related endotoxemia. So what that means is when you're eating meat, you're getting leaky gut, and you're getting more gram-negative bacteria, and some of the gram-negative bacteria, their LPS gets released and gets into the the blood that's bad in the gut lining it'll cause a lot of inflammation in the blood it has a slightly prothrombotic effect um, bacteria even uh, sometimes get into the blood usually the liver is able to clear them pretty well the liver's got macrophages called cupfer cells and they sit around in the liver sinusoid and they remove any bacteria that had inadvertently gotten into the into the blood you know across the gut lining because the, the guts connected to the liver through the portal vein okay if the blood has high ferritin, you know, those are the iron uh, binding proteins that are normally only intracellular, but when a cell dies, sometimes they'll, like especially acutely necrosis, they'll sometimes get into the, the blood and their iron content can be released. They carry a lot of iron, like 4,500 molecules of iron per ferritin molecule. When you have elevated iron in the blood, that's bad. The iron will cycle between its different uh, transitional states. It's a transitional metal because it has a variable valence. It can cycle most commonly between Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. And in that process, electrons can be donated to, to do what is called a Fenton reaction, and that'll produce free radicals, you know, combining with oxygen. And those free radicals are like a super ball bouncing around inside a building, you know, a bull in a china shop, and they'll break stuff. So anyways, that's sort of a special circumstance, and that's more of a problem in older people because they tend to be more iron overloaded. Um, but it can be simultaneous with a high-fat meal and, and cause a lot of uh, tissue damage. Um, a lot of times when a person eats a high-fat meal, think about it, you know, they're eating uh, hamburger and fries, lots of sodium. Sodium is a vasoconstrictor. That'll raise blood pressure, and the vasoconstriction means to narrow an artery will decrease blood supply to different tissues so you can get more hypoxia, more ischemia, more blood-brain barrier damage potentially. If a person has excessive psychological stress, stress equivalent, sleep deprivation, or caffeine, that can also uh, be associated with vasoconstriction due to the catecholamines, 
and that can also be pro, it is prothrombotic. It'll increase fibrinogen. It's an acute phase reactant protein from the liver. Um, it'll also increase these other uh, clotting factors. So all of these things happen after high fat meal, and that's why the more you study fat the more you want to avoid it. Like I said, I don't think there's any good fats. I think that whole good fats thing is just a slogan to trick people into eating more fat. I think the Mediterranean diet is also pretty much nowadays just a slogan to chump people. Back when Ansel Key studied it in the 1950s, he thought of it as a primarily vegetarian, getting closer to vegan diet, whereas people have distorted the Mediterranean diet in the modern world to the point where it's really just a joke. They say, oh, it's okay to drink alcohol, it's okay to have fish. Um, I don't know them specifically, including just about anything. And if you look at the results on outcomes of Mediterranean diet, um, like let's say compared to the Esselstyn diet, Esselstyn had more than 30 times better results in terms of coronary artery uh, related outcomes. So it's, it's really a joke and I, I can't believe it. You'll see there's so many doctors, including almost all the Ivy League ones, going, oh, I think the Mediterranean diet's the best diet. And they think they sound smart when they say that. They really sound stupid and ignorant. Um, okay, here it is, Another art more articles about single fat meal. Single fat meal provokes pathological Erythrocyte. Erythrocyte is red blood cell remodeling. So high fat meal um, causes acute lipemia. Let's see what was interesting here. I'm talking about this was done in mice. Um, then they did it in humans, 10 healthy individuals. Um, after they fed them the high fat meal, the triglycerides go up. That's bad. Their cholesterol goes up. Bad. Free fatty acids go up. Um, when you look at red blood cell, let's say under a microscope on a peripheral smear, just like take some blood out, look at it on our slide, there's about 700 red blood cells for every white blood cell. So whatever's happening to the RBCs, that's the dominant thing in the blood. Um, and that's why also hematocrit going up will uh, can cause hypertension because uh, it makes the blood thicker. Um, this just talks about a few other bad things that happen. It's all bad. It's all bad. The high fat meal used in this particular experiment with humans was a milkshake. So, and that, by the way, that would be one of my major criticisms of all these uh, fat studies and their relationship to blood in the brain is they'll often just say fat. They don't specifically tell you how much was saturated fat, how much was MUFA or PUFA, monounsaturated fat or polyunsaturated fat. Um, it also depends on where they checked it. These patients were evaluated four hours postprandial. That's a reasonable amount of time frame because sometimes they'll evaluate them too soon, one or two hours postprandial, and that's not... Uh, you got to give more time for all that fat to get in the blood and have its effect. Okay, so here is the effect of ICM is an isocaloric meal. Red blood cells look normal. So here it is with a high fat meal. Some of them became a little smaller, microcytosis. Here's a canthocytosis, and that's asymmetric spurring. The way I remember that, and by the way, this is how I remembered everything in med school, just about. A for a canthocyte. A canto means sperm. So you look up what the meaning of the root of the word is. Then you look at A, and it's asymmetric. So A for asymmetric, A for a canthocyte. That works, okay? Now here's a kinocyte. A kino means hedgehog, like a porcupine. So it's got spikes. And then remember E for echinocyte, E for equal, equal spacing of all the spikes. And that's how you distinguish between an acanthocyte and echinocyte. Um, so those little word associations are great for memorizing stuff. Okay, um, the macrophages also take on a foamy appearance. These are the monocytes in the blood. When a, when a monocyte moves extracellular, like across the endothelial lining, it'll become a macrophage, but it has to be smaller in the blood, otherwise it wouldn't get through the capillaries. But anyways, this is a big deal. The high fat meal is causing distortion of the shapes of red blood cells, and there's a lot of them, and that's gonna decrease their ability to deliver oxygen, that's bad. And in the context of all the other stuff, sticking together, becoming more prothrombotic, that's all bad. And that's why a high fat meal in a person with baseline coronary artery disease can precipitate uh, myocardial infarction, a heart attack. That's also why all these people on the internet saying saturated fat's okay. I mean, it's pretty ridiculous. They just sound like total ignoramuses. There's tons of literature to study all this stuff. Um, when you give heparin, it'll you know, and it'll help with the reduction of lipemia of uh, sticking the red blood cells together. It'll improve oxygen transfer. Okay, that's one thing that. I don't want to get into all the details on heparin. That's a whole other topic, but oxygen availability in brain tissues. Uh, so this was done by Roy Swankel. And I told you how he would measure the oxygen availability in the hamster brains. And he was finding that they caused a, a big drop in oxygenation. It was worse with the saturated fats. Um, it was intermediate with the MUFAs. And it wasn't as bad in this particular context, in his opinion, with the more unsaturated oils. These are like omega-6 oils and stuff. Um, 
But don't get me wrong, there's a lot of problems with omega-6s with lipid peroxidation and stuff. So there's also a difference between a short-term effect and something might not be so bad short-term, but longer-term, you know, all oils are liquid fat. They're going to, over time, tend to make the patient obese, and then the patient's going to have all the problems related to that, including increased risk of hyperlipidemia, diabetes, etc. Okay, elementary lipemia enhances procoagulatory effects of inflammation. Yeah, because in particular with the meat, you're going to get more LPS into the blood, and that's prothrombotic, okay, especially in that context, LPS plus lipemia. Lipemia means increased lipids in the blood. And by the way, the papers I'm showing here are just the ones that I thought were like the better papers. There's tons of papers on all this stuff. Okay, okay, this is an AO alert, academic organism alert. Erythrocytes are oxygen sensors and modulators of vascular tone. So what does that mean? What it means is the red blood cells are like so intelligent. The chemistry of the body is so intelligent. It's amazing. It's so far beyond what humans could do. And what I mean by that is when the red blood cells traveling through the arterioles and the capillaries, as it starts to release its oxygen, then the hemoglobin will undergo a shape change. When the hemoglobin within the red blood cell undergoes a shape change, it'll release um, ATP into the blood. The ATP will interact with the lining cells, the endothelium, and it, I'm going to show you a picture of this in just a second. I'm, I'm sort of going through the words here, but in a moment I'll show you the picture. It'll be easier to follow this. It will cause vasodilatation. That, that extends proximally, and by opening up the diameter of the artery, it gets more oxygen delivery. And this is a real key point. You need this... Uh, ability of the red blood cells to release their ATP and vasodilate in the setting of a more significant oxygen drop due to high tissue usage of oxygen. So basically when a tissue becomes active, it'll burn more oxygen um, in the mitochondria, so it'll need more oxygen delivery. And the red blood cell is able to sense that. It's brilliant, okay? So here's where this gets more interesting. If you have a diabetic or somebody just with insulin resistance, not even a full diabetic, as their hemoglobin A1C goes up, the red blood cell is less able to release ATP, so you increase the risk of hypoxia. And you'll see, if you talk to doctors that work with diabetic patients, they are so profoundly uh, cognitively impaired, so many of them, it's really sad and pathetic. I know a few of them that are doing okay. I even know a doctor in his 70s who's done pretty well with his diabetes, and he's very aware of all the little details here. Um, but I, I, I'll, I'll just tell you in a moment, like I know an internal medicine doctor I just spoke to recently, and she said that almost all of her patients over 60 are cognitively impaired. And that's kind of been my experience, too. So many of these patients, I'll, I'll show a picture of what they remind me of. They're kind of sad and hopeless. It's depressing. That's probably why I make this channel. Because I know the people who go to the, watch the videos on this channel, they're much, much, much smarter and intellectually curious compared to the regular crowd of people in this country, okay? Uh, so as long as a person wants to learn... There's hope. They can do well. All this stuff is preventable. Okay, um, this I thought was fascinating. The higher the hemoglobin A1C, the less able was the red blood cell to release ATP in response to uh, diminishing oxygen and the need for dilating that artery to get increased uh, oxygen delivery. So if you can't deliver oxygen when you need it, you can damage that tissue, including the brain cells. And that was why that's a mechanism for cognitive impairment. So here's what it's basically going. Imagine this artery in the middle here is the baseline. And the red blood cells, as they're purple or bluish, that means they've lost a lot of their oxygen carrying capacity. The red ones are still fully loaded with oxygen. Okay, so if you have this pattern right here and you need more oxygen getting to this area, you can dilate this artery. See how this is wider now than it was up here? And now you're going to get more of these big, uh, fully red, red blood cells going in there. They're going to deliver more oxygen. And you have to be able to do that. So how does the red blood cell do that? So imagine this red blood cell over here is the one that I'm going to be over here. As it's traveling through this artery, it's sensing that there's a lot of tissue activity right here. Like let's say it's a neuron, very busily engaged. It'll need more oxygen so it can keep on producing a lot of energy. Well, when this starts delivering oxygen, this is a red blood cell, it's giving off oxygen, the oxygen's coming off its hemoglobin, its hemoglobin undergoes a shape change, it'll release ATP that then binds with what's called a purine receptor, and it will then cause vasodilatation, and it will pass that proximally to sort of dilate up this artery so more oxygen can be delivered in the tissue. And the whole point of this is that you've got neurovascular coupling. So let's say this is a neuron here, and this is vascular. The neuronal activity, amount and rate of glucose utilization is coupled to oxygen delivery. That's super important. 
because that enables the blood flow to be carefully adjusted, carefully tailored to the oxygen needs. Let's say I have neuronal tissue right here. And the genius of it all is that the red blood cell can handle things in real time and make it all work. Releases the ATP from the red blood cell as it gives off its oxygen and hemoglobin shape change. Lots of things in, in, in cell biology are based on shape change. The hemoglobin changes shape. That causes an ATP to be released. The ATP causes vasodilatation. dilatation. Endo means endothelial cell. SMC means smooth muscle cell. And that passes proximally. So the artery dilates in response to increase oxygen demand. And that way oxygen delivery is matched to the amount of metabolic activity in those neurons. And that's perfect. That's how everything works well. That's what's normal, what's supposed to happen. And if you have a high hemoglobin A1C, like we were saying, then you can't do that as effectively. And uh, the person starts... Uh, not getting enough oxygen to their tissue and their increased risk of brain damage. Okay, now a couple of articles showing the effects of high-fat meal and how these cause brain damage. Okay, here's Western diets in uh, these rats, and they followed them after 10, 40, and 90 days of a westernized diet. Um, and they know that you need insulin. You need insulin to get correct function of brain endothelial cells and hippocampal cells and hypothalamic cells. And so strong is the association with insulin resistance and diabetes that Alzheimer's disease has been caused type 3 diabetes. I actually prefer the word dementia rather than Alzheimer's disease. I kind of think Alzheimer's disease is a joke. Um, I've talked about that in other lectures before. So I prefer the word dementia. As soon as you say the word Alzheimer's, it tends to make people stupid. All of a sudden, they don't know what they're talking about because Alzheimer's is sort of a bogus diagnosis. If you read, you know, some typical source will go, oh, Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia. Yeah, right. What's the clinical finding, physical finding on exam? There is none. What's the historical finding? There's not any specific one, okay? What's the finding on imaging? There's not a good specific imaging test. There are some imaging tests that can push you in that direction, but they're not that specific. What about autopsy? Well, gee, they can't really effectively tell that well Alzheimer's at autopsy. So, and then what about the treatment? Well, take this pill. It doesn't really work, but give it a try. I mean, does that sound like BS or what? You can't effectively diagnose it, and you can't effectively treat it, treat it, but you just say it's there, and you can't effectively distinguish it from other diseases that well, so you say it's there. And I look at brain MRIs, and then they'll come with a history of dementia. You say Alzheimer's, but I very seldom see that so-called characteristic appearance of Alzheimer's with you know medial temporal lobe atrophy and hippocampal atrophy, perhaps associated with um, you know parietal atrophy. I just don't see that. I see diffuse cerebral atrophy by far most commonly. Okay, um, let's see what else. Higher order brain functions rely on accurate responsive signaling processes. So if you're leaking from your blood-brain barrier, you cannot maintain the local environment around your neurons. That's a big problem. Okay, um, increased blood-brain barrier permeability induces neurodegeneration, destruction of the brain tissue, because it permits the influx of neurotoxic substances. Okay. And this is what I meant by these high-fat diets. They're not just a little bit unhealthy. They're a disaster. You know, you could, like, look at every hospital in the United States in the morning. You'll have this river of fat, cognitively impaired people walking in the door, okay? That is the typical American, you know, after 55 years of age. Uh, this diet just destroys the health and the brains of people. And so another question I sometimes get, do I think people are getting dumber? You betcha. If you go back to the 1800s and actually read and study the 1800s a while, it's amazed how smart the people were, okay? They read all these books. Okay, here's another quote I got from a 27-year-old uh, man said to me one time. He said, oh, he said to me, you know, you should make your videos more simple because almost everybody has attention deficit disorder these days. I think it's because everybody's on their cell phones too much. You know, I don't know about that. My experience with young people is they eat tons of junk food and they can get away with a lot of it because when you're young, you got more reserve than an older person does, but they're not as healthy as they could be. Um, and, and also, a typical young guy, you know, they watch some bodybuilder and they get all these bad ideas about nutrition and health from these bodybuilders. You know, these bodybuilders are all buffed out, taking anabolic steroids, but they tell these poor young kids it's because of their protein supplement and their creatine and eating this terrible diet. And then the, the young kids take their diet and they make themselves fat and sick. Okay, anyways, in the 1800s, it was routine to read novels that are 500 to 1,200 pages long. They would routinely put these into three volumes and call them triple-decker novels. The libraries would like that. They could loan out the book in three parts. So what am I saying is that in the 1800s, it was routine to get a person to read, you know, a 1,000-page novel. 
Whereas nowadays, good luck getting somebody to read a five page uh, article, okay? Oh, uh, you know, the, all they're reading is, you know, Twitter message, social media, f you know. The people who are watching this video, this is a complicated video, okay? This is a different crowd. But we all know when we deal with sort of just the general public, um, most Americans, they're functionally illiterate, meaning that they learn how to read in grade school, but they don't ever read a book on their own. And so if you don't read, that means functional illiteracy, okay? Okay, so Les Mis, 1,200 pages. Les Mis. Brothers Karamazov, about 800 pages. Anna Karenina, 600 pages. The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, 400 pages. People would read that routinely. So here's that uh, Liberty Leading the People. This was in France, you know, I think this was in 1830. Oh, it's by Eugene Delacroix. I forgot to put that in there. Eugene Delacroix, 1830. Okay, what percent of your peer, your friends that you know would read a triple-decker novel, okay? How many people do you know that will read triple-decker novels? And I realize the first argument is, well, there was nothing else to do in those days. There was no TV, there was no internet, there was no radio. Um, that's all true, but still, it takes some effort and it's well worth it. I read all these books. They're well worth reading. Okay, rates of cognitive and emotional disorders that impair cognition are very high. Autism is off the charts. Attention deficit is off the charts. Lots of people with brain fog, anxiety, you know, difficulty concentrating, all age groups, uh, depression, mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment is so common that it's basically considered normal amongst people over 60 nowadays. Okay, vascular cognitive impairment, diabetes-related cognitive impairment. And diabetes patients I see, they're so slow and pathetic, most of them. I just feel sorry for them. Okay, so what do I, what do I think these people are like? They remind me like a sheep, okay? They don't read. They don't watch health videos on the internet. So it's impossible for them to ever get better. They put all their hope and faith and trust in some doctor, and the doctor himself probably doesn't know anything about nutrition, and just puts them on whatever is a standard medication for their level of you know, hemoglobin A1C and blood glucose level, okay? Um, Th there's zero hope of these patient people ever being cured. I see this all the time with hypertensive patients, obese patients, um, diabetic patients. And like the only thing that could cure somebody who's not willing to do anything on their own would be that if, you know, the sheep herder, the sheep dog kind of got them to go into a different area where they had to eat healthy plant foods. But I think with a lot of these people, they've all just given up on themselves. So, you know, I always be nice to them. I'm happy to help any of them if they want to be helped. But I know tons of fat people and almost all of them have just given up on themselves, and they don't even want to talk about it. The people who are most eager to ask questions are, you know, people from 50 to about 85 that are sick and they've got a problem. They're a little mm -hmm. scared. Um, they want answers, okay, or they got somebody in their family who they want to help. Okay, hippocampal function is impaired by a short-term high-fat diet. So basically, a high-fat diet causes decreased memory in mice, and it causes decreased mood. And here's... And humans tend to overlap a lot with mice. In this group, they fed them 60% fat. And what's unique about this study was they, um, they had impaired memory just within three days. They were already having increased blood-brain barrier permeability just within two days. So it happened really fast. Um, and it's causing damage to their hippocampus. It's causing damage to their mitochondria. So basically, when you're eating these high-sat fat diets and these high-oil diets, you're, you're like poisoning yourself. It's stupid. Um, and this is a cool concept of a graphical abstract. I actually think these journals, you know what they ought to do, is have all the authors make a quick video to summarize their article. That would make the medical literature. I think if a journal was willing to do that, they would become the most popular journal pretty fast if they had good articles. Because so many of these articles are written by these PhDs and they, 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 they suck at writing and it's hard to, you got to make some effort to make sense out of it. But anyways, this is a pretty cool study. Within two days, there was already major problems, increased blood brain permeability, three days, the memory is impaired. Within five days, the mouse, the mice shown what is in mice terms considered depressive behavior. Food and mood go together. Okay, you know, what's happened in your life, that of course has a big effect too. But you know, you give your best chance of uh, being happy and healthy, mentally sharp, uh, by eating a healthy diet, which is you know, whole food, low fat, very low fat, low sodium, plant-based diet, 100 percent organic. Um, and then you started having mitochondrial dysfunction and damage. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. So, you know, the whole point of this talk is what I'm showing you is these dietary lipids in excess just progressively destroy the body's tissue and then the brain, okay? And 
I got started on this because all the articles about multiple sclerosis were showing how the high fat, especially sad fat, but high fat diets were causing brain damage. And like I said, the more you look into the effect of high fat diets on brain damage, the more you will find. So in this study, the mice were fed a 60% fat in comparison with the low fat diet was 10% fat. And you know, the diet I eat is around 10% fat, a little less than that really. The McDougal diet is about 7% fat. Kempner diet was about 5% fat or a little lower. And so the high fat diet causes decreased memory in just one day. So in the, in the previous page, I've shown you decreased memory was shown at three days. In this study, this was done with mice, they were showing the high fat diet causing impaired memory within one day, one day. That's rather amazing how bad that is, okay? So here, this is all color coded. The blue is blue for low fat diet. The red is for high fat diet. The green is high fat diet reversal, meaning that they started feeding it low fat. So looking at the blue here, low fat, these all had better memory performance. The red down here is, the red down here was um, about the high fat diet poor memory performance. And then when they change them to the low fat diet, their memory performance would start to improve pretty quickly. Uh, within just a day, it was going up. And then by two days, it was pretty close to baseline. So this is why a person wants to start eating healthy as soon as they can, because, you know, as months go by, years go by, decades go by, more and more brain damage is going to become irreversible. And, you know, that'll be sad. And here's kind of like, what is it like? What's it like being a doctor, working in any hospital in America or a Western country. All the high fat, people eating all the processed food, all the meat, you know, they, they plug up all their arteries, they go for open heart surgery, they get tons of gallstones, appendicitis, diverticulitis, diabetes, get all these amputations. They're sad, their life's all messed up. Um, and then you look at these whole food plant-based betters, they're skinny and healthy, okay? They don't get all these diseases. I mean, it's like, it's like as obvious as it gets. And what am I saying? Am I saying all those low-carb, keto, paleo people are liars and ignoramuses? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, um, so here's a little bit about diabetes. And, oh, here's a typical thing that diabetics will say to me. My diabetes, it's okay. It's under control from the pills they take. Okay, That's what all the typical ignorant, stupid people say. What a smart person says, I will become a low-fat vegan. I'm going to try to cure it. Okay. If you watch like Ruth Heidrich, PhD, she's the lady who cured herself of, of metastatic breast cancer. She went and talked to Dr. McDougall. She said, in just, you know, talking to McDougall for like a couple hours, she said, I became a vegan on the spot. Okay, she didn't need to go through 20 years of soul searching. It was obvious. Become a low food, whole fat vegan or you're, you're screwed for health, okay? And you know, when you got metastatic cancer, there's not a lot of time to waste. But for anybody, you know, we got herbivore physiology. And if you eat a high fat diet, you plug up your arteries. There's no way around that. So here's basically the fat staging system of diabetes. Fat accumulates in the belly, subcutaneous, et cetera, visceral. Then it starts to accumulate in skeletal muscle. When it accumulates in the skeletal muscle, it causes insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle. Then it accumulates in the liver, causes insulin resistance in the liver. Then it accumulates in the pancreas and destroys the beta cells. That's a typical course of uh, diabetes, right? Um, the reason why high fat is such a disaster. It's the main cause, especially saturated fat, but high fat diets in general, saturated fat in particular, it's just able to get across the skeletal muscle plasma membrane. This is the study that helps show that it wasn't even the transporters. It just goes right across the membrane. So the more you eat, the more it's going to get into that skeletal muscle eventually and cause insulin resistance. Once it gets into the skeletal muscle, it causes insulin resistance. I got a whole bunch of lectures on that, so we won't go into too much detail on that, but you just know that High fat meals on a routine basis, disaster. Cause insulin resistance and diabetes. Okay, now, then you see there's a whole bunch of articles showing that brain insulin resistance, is, they call it in Alzheimer's disease. They call Alzheimer's disease a lot of times type 3 dementia. It's big time associated with cognitive decline. Um, brain insulin resistance appears to be an early and common feature of Alzheimer's dementia. Just call it dementia, promoting cognitive decline. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you why that is in just a moment here. Okay, here's another study. Uh, in just three days of a high-fat diet, you've got central insulin resistance, okay? And so central insulin, insulin resistance means central nervous system in the brain. And it ends up becoming a disaster, progressive loss of brain cells, okay? And it also makes the person less able to control their appetite. That's partly why they've given up on themselves. They know they can't do it. Now, this next slide I thought was really interesting. 
So this is a picture of the brain. Here is the blood-brain barrier, BBB, blood-brain barrier. GLUT1 means glucose type 1 transporter. The little light blue here is glucose. And glucose crosses from the blood across the blood-brain barrier through these glucose type 1 transporters. They do not depend on insulin. So a glucose type 1 transporter and these number 3s over here, glucose type 3 transporters, they transport glucose without needing insulin to be involved. Okay? And that's been known for a long time. So people will say, oh, the brain is not doesn't depend on insulin. Insulin's not relevant to the brain. That is completely wrong. Insulin is very important for the brain. And here's what I'm going to show you that these brain cells, these are brain neurons, those are the ones that transmit neuronal messages. They've got glucose type 4s. Glucose type 4 are the same one that you have in the skeletal muscle. They are insulin dependent. And this is a big deal because what, is, what I'm saying here is the neuron has to be able to bring glucose in through these glucose type 4 when it's, when it's highly active. And if it can't get glucose in through these glucose type 4, which are insulin dependent, it can't do the things it wants to. And it's at increased risk for apoptosis, meaning programmed cell death due to the energy supply doesn't meet the energy demands. So that's one example, that last slide, why diabetes will cause brain damage, loss of neurons, apoptosis, programmed cell death in neurons. And as you lose neurons, you gradually become stupider. Okay, here's another reason why you get brain damage with diabetes. Okay, I made a whole video about this called Does Diabetes Make People Stupid? Here is the endoplasmic reticulum in a cell, often abbreviated ER. And the endoplasmic reticulum in the old school books will just show it you know, up close to the nucleus is sort of a, a packaging plant, you know, for making uh, proteins and, you know, steroids and, and things like that. But if you look at a more realistic staining of a cell, you see the endoplasmic reticulum is all over on virtually the entire cell outside the nucleus. And it has contact points where it'll contact mitochondria. These mitochondrial contact points are called MAMs, mitochondria-associated membranes. And the relevance for us is that when, when, let's say you're walking down a path in a forest and all of a sudden you see a pack of wolves. You're like, oh shit, I got to run, I got to climb this tree or do whatever you got to do to try to save your life from those wolves. Well, the point is you all of a sudden have to ramp up your, uh, your use of your brain cells to navigate the fastest you know, path out of that danger zone. And so the point is <clears throat> you have to be able to quickly go from zero to 100 miles per hour in terms of the neuronal level of activity. And so what happens is the calcium release from endoplasmic reticulum goes straight into the mitochondria. That causes a rapid upregulation of the Krebs cycle enzyme. TCA cycle, same thing as Krebs cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle. And the glucose normally should be coming into the cell. The insulin glucose type 4 transporters will allow more glucose into the cell. And then you can run glycolysis and Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation along the inner mitochondrial memory. So what's the point of all this? The point is that if you've got insulin resistance, like on that previous slide, and your glucose type 4 transporters, you can't get extra glucose in here. Well, the endoplasmic reticulum doesn't understand that so well. It keeps on releasing calcium, saying, hey, get moving, get moving, come on, we got to run, the wolves are coming. Get moving, get moving. And it keeps on pushing calcium into the mitochondria. But the glucose isn't getting there, so the calcium just sits there. And when the calcium levels get high enough, they just damage the mitochondria and kill it. So you lose the brain cell. So that's why insulin resistance in the brain is a big deal because it kills brain cells. And I just showed you the two mechanisms, you know, inability to get um, your glucose in there so you can oxygenate and also apoptosis, uh, neurovascular uncoupling, so you can't meet the metabolic demands of the neuron, which when that gap is big enough between metabolic demands and energy supply, the neuron just dies, apoptosis. Over time, things just get worse. Chronic diabetes will lead to thickening of this basement membrane. So here's the basement membrane. It's in yellow. This is the basement membrane. This is a uh, small arteriole capillary. These are the endothelial cells. They're sort of spindle-shaped. There's a nucleus of the endothelial cell. Red blood cells deforming a little bit as they pass through here. So they enter here with this red arrow, exit with this red arrow. These little blue dots are the oxygen being released from the red blood cells, and they go to the neuron. Okay, so that's how it normally should be. The upper part of the picture is normal. The green stuff here is the vascular smooth muscle cells. Those are the ones that can vasodilate to open things up. Okay, here was endothelial cell. So here's where you got a diabetic. See how the yellow uh, basement membrane here is very thick? Here's a normal thin one. Here's a thick one. Well, the thicker this gets, the more difficult it is to deliver oxygen to the neuron. So capillary basement membrane thickening due to diabetes or hypertension gets worse over time and decreases oxygen delivery. So you see how this neuron is progressively more screwed as time goes by? This capillary basement membrane is getting thicker, so less oxygen is getting through. As we showed on that earlier picture with the GLUC4s, there's insulin resistance, so they can't get more glucose in there. 
but this neuron's gonna have a lot of things to do. And let's say this person's, you know, a uh, typical ignorant person, they're, they're not sleeping enough, they're drinking a lot of caffeine and coffee a couple times a day, so they're ramping up this metabolic demand, plus they're all stressed out. Well, they're ramping up the metabolic demand in this neuron, let's say the metabolic demand's up here, but the oxygen glucose delivery is down here, so oxygen glucose delivery should be equal to metabolic demand. Should, let's say they should be both at the same line, but if one's high, the other's low, and they're, you're getting not enough oxygen glucose delivery, that neuron can die, just goes into apoptosis, program cell death. And a lot of times this happens gradually over time such that the person's not even aware it's happening, but they're just becoming, you know, fatter and stupider. That's super common. Okay, so here's what's happening in the brain. This is the internal carotid artery. It goes up into the brain. Here's the middle cerebral artery. It passes then up along the convexity of the brain. And these are the penetrating arteries of the brain. This is called the watershed region where I drew the skull and crossbones. Here's the ventricle. So we typically refer to this as periventricular area. One of the things I do is I work as a neuroradiologist. I look at these brain MRIs all the time. And so this tissue right here would be the periventricular white matter, okay? Above the ventricles is the centrum semiovale because it's in the center of the brain and it's semi-oval in shape, okay? This would be called the corona radiata periventricular region, okay? Because it looks like a crown. Corona, like a crown radiata that radiates, you know, out from the center of the brain down here at this level. This is the basal ganglia level where you got the deep nuclei, like the lentiform nuclei, okay? This is the globus pallidus. Okay, and that's the putame in there. But anyways, here's the point. When you got high blood pressure, it'll have cause shearing injuries in these little arteries here called the lenticulostrites. It'll cause strokes in this area. When you got excessively low blood pressure, let's say overtreated hypertension, you drop the blood supply. These penetrating arteries can't get enough uh, blood to this area, and so you'll get these silent strokes in this area. Usually they're silent. Sometimes they can be symptomatic. But what I'm saying is all of these things are happening simultaneously in these diabetics and in people eating high fat meals. Because high fat makes you hypertension, then the hypertension gets treated, often overtreated, and then they start getting all these uh, strokes. And, and they're little strokes and often they're silent. And that's why in, in, if I see, let's say in a 55 year old, you know, less than five, I would call that mild periventricular flare hyperintensity is most likely due to small vessel atherosclerotic disease. If I see, you know, let's say, you know, five to about 25, I'd call that moderate periventricular flare hyperintensity most likely due to small vessel atherosclerotic disease. If I see more than that, I'll say extensive, severe. But the point I'm making is I usually see mild to moderate on almost every single patient in that uh, 55 to 65 age group. Okay, so here's a neuron. Here's a cell body with its nucleus. Here's where a lot of its mitochondria are. An action potential will begin, let's say, at the axon hillock about right here. These are nodes of Ranvier where there's extra myelin fat insulating the neuron, speeding up conduction. And then the the influx of sodium at the sodium channels has to pass all the way along this uh, neuron axon until it gets to the synaptic terminal. This is where the neurotransmitters are to be released. They go across the synaptic cleft, they interact with the postsynaptic neuron, and they induce an effect in the postsynaptic neuron. Most common neurotransmitter is glutamate, and it's excitatory, meaning that it'll increase the likelihood of the postsynaptic neuron have firing its own action potential. Okay, So my, the, the reason I'm showing this slide is that this area around the neuron has to maintain very precise concentrations of sodium, potassium, calcium, and if the blood-brain barrier is leaking, it will, it will distort these uh, ionic gradients, meaning the neurons won't function well, and guess what? That means the person will have brain fog, and it can also cause them to have mood problems, feel depressed or anxious. So getting your diet right improves your mood and it makes you smarter. Typically, a meat processed food diet is very high in sodium and it's low in um, potassium. K plus kalium is potassium and magnesium. Mg2 plus is magnesium. Magnesium and potassium, the things you need, most people are deficient in, they come from plants. And then the stuff you want to avoid, the sodium, that comes from a meat and a processed food diet. It's, it's pretty much always that way that basically all the good stuff comes from whole food plants, low fat plants, and all the bad stuff comes from meat and processed foods. That's a safe assumption in the nutrition world. Magnesium is needed with all these ATP reactions because the positive charge of magnesium helps to offset the negative charges of the phosphate. That's why ATP generates so much energy. You let that phosphate pop off and it'll cause a, a movement by its big powerful electron, electric uh, negative charge. Okay, but you, that's why you need that magnesium so much and it's in so many reactions. Okay, this part of the brain is called the hippocampus. It almost means like seahorse in another language. It can look a little bit like a seahorse. But these, this is one of the levels of CA1. Um, the hippocampus is very sensitive to hypotension, sensitive to hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, low blood pressure. 
And this is a key point because this is our memory center. It's the most important memory center in the brain. And those neurons, they've got glute fours and they're real sensitive. They got a lot of glute fours. So you cause central insulin resistance, you're going to be causing damage to your hippocampal neurons. Not good. And by the way, the brain cells cannot remove, cannot burn uh, fat adequately. They can burn ketone bodies, you know, in a starvation situation, but they cannot burn fatty acids well, like with beta oxidation, for example, within the mitochondrial matrix. So the point is, if you're eating a high fat diet, you're screwing your hippocampal neurons. And the reason is you're going to induce insulin resistance. So their glucose type four transporters won't work and they can't get enough glucose into the cell. And all that fat floating around in the blood doesn't do them any good because they can't metabolize it. So that's what I'm joking about. You got this big fat person and their belly is overloaded with fat, their liver is overloaded with fat, but their poor brain cells and their hippocampus are starving because they can't burn the fat and they can't get the glucose, so they're screwed. And that's why so many of these diabetics, you know, they're, they're fat and sick and they just get fat, sick, and stupider over time and there's not much you can do. Either they make a decision to learn. So what am I trying to say? The way you help a person is you teach them to learn how to help themselves. And if they don't want to learn, and in my experience, most don't, they just want a quick fix, a pill or a surgery, they don't ever get better. They just progressively deteriorate. Okay, this is just a repeat of that slide with the mitochondria-associated membranes releasing the calcium into the mitochondria, the mitochondrial matrix to upregulate, rapidly increase the amount of Krebs cycle enzymes so they can rapidly increase neuronal activity in the setting of you know more intense cognitive activity. For example, you know, running from a wolf. <laughs> um, and when you can't do this, you overload these uh, mitochondria with calcium and they become destroyed and they go into apoptosis. Okay, and then this is just the last slide. That was the mitochondria associated membranes from the endoplasmic reticulum that we just talked about. This is just a little more description of what I talked about there a moment ago. And basically, a high fat diet inducing insulin resistance functions like an excitotoxin where you've got increased neuronal activity relative to. Um, your metabolic supply of oxygen and glucose, and you're losing neurons to apoptosis. And it's a gradual process, but it happens, you know, day after day, year after year, decade after decade, and you got a progressively cognitively impaired person. So anyways, I hope, uh, I hope that was interesting and helpful.